groups to the talk about how to pick a cake flavor. Well, we're gonna, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So um, we're gonna talk about consensus algorithms, but we're also gonna talk about cake. So if you could indulge me, pull up your phone. We're gonna do a little polling here. So if you could search this website called Slido, I'm no advertisement, but it's a cool thing. So enter this event code. Let me know once you're on there. 8989. We're all good? Okay, look up if you're on the website, if you join the event. Great, I'm gonna display the poll. So please answer the question, have you used any distributed system related software or libraries? So when we talk about distributed system softwares, one example would be email, and other examples will be what website? Ooh, so I see no increasing, what's not? Oh, it's decreasing now, good. So we've used emails before, right? Cool, and look up once you're done answering the question. Okay, okay, let's move on to the, oh good, 9%. Let's move on to the next question. Can you describe the details of one of the consensus algorithms used in any of the distributed systems? By describe, meaning that can you um, explain why it works, how it works? Cool, oh wow, 9%, 10%. I would love to talk with people who clicked Absolutely, this is easy. Find me afterwards. You only said one. Sorry? You only said one. one, yeah. If you can do one, that's amazing. Okay, so are we done? Good. Okay, so as you can see, based on the poll, most of us have used um, distributed system related softwares, but only a few of us can really describe what it is, like how machines collaborate together in a distributed system setting. So the goal of this talk would be to close the gap between the people who use this distributed system softwares um, to help them understand how the machines really work together. So let's switch back to the slides. Good, okay, great. Let's go back to the slides. Okay, so let's first talk about what, what is a distributed system. You can think of them as components located on different parts of the network, and they communicate, collaborate via message sending. So one example, or a few examples of a uh, distributed system would be the web, the client are the browsers, and the server is the web server. Also DNS and BitTorrents are also examples of distributed systems. Well, fun fact, in 1920s, American Central, American Airlines Central Office, they used to have this office where they have a deck of cards for each flight. And the traveling agents will call in and say, I want to buy a seat. And could you please check if the seat has been sold or not? So the, the um, people who work in the office will just say, okay, the seat has been marked, so you have to pick a different one. Or it has, been not, it has not been sold yet, so you can buy the seat. And they will mark the seat as sold. So, this is a very early example of a human distributed system. Distributed systems are great. They are powerful, they help us to solve a lot of problems, but they all, there are also challenges when we use them. First of all, all, none of the machines really have a global knowledge of what's going on in, in the overall setting, right? You, you, as a state machine, you only know what's going on in your machine, and you also have knowledge of the messages that you got, but you have no idea of the overall the whole um, system. So how do they exchange information? How do we make sure that information is up to date? How do we detect inconsistencies in the distributed system? Also, we have different machines working together and they have their own time. So how do we, when there are clock skews, when we receive delayed or duplicate messages, how do we know that? And how do we know which order we receive those messages? It's very common in a distributed system setting that you have concurrent operations on one single object. So when that happens, how do we ensure that the object is in a consistent state? And how do we deal with conflicts? Leslie Lamport has mentioned that a distributed system is a system where there's some other computer over the network that 
it could, its failure could cause your own machine unusable. So how do we really handle, tolerate that kind of failures? And by tolerate, we mean how do we detect, how do we handle them, and how do we recover from them? So consensus algorithms in distributed system could really help you to solve a lot of those problems. They help to keep your system um, consistent uh, and also fault tolerant. So today we're going to talk about Paxos and Raft. Let's start, first start with Paxos. Compared to other algorithms, Paxos has a, has a very colorful background. It was first implemented and developed by Lynch and Liskov. But when they developed and implemented this algorithm, they couldn't really find a mathematical proof that proved the, why the algorithm works right. So Leslie Lamport found this paper, and he had a very malicious thought. He said, I'm going to prove this wrong. And he worked really hard on this, but he accidentally proved it right. <laughs> so uh, he wrote this little cute story about the part-time parliament, which explains the island of Paxos and how those cute little islands work together um, to have consensus. And he tried to um, publish the paper, but he got rejected. And he kept trying. After 10 years, his paper was accepted. The problem was that nobody could really understand what he was talking about. People were so caught up in the, um, the game and the fancy names in the paper. So one day he was at a conference, and people said, you know, we read your paper. We really don't understand what you're talking about. Can you just explain? And he sat down. He didn't talk about any of the story or anything. He just simply explained Paxos. And people understood. So he was very inspired. He went home, wrote this paper called Paxos Made Simple, which is, describes as how Paxos works, which we're going to discuss today. Also, he wrote a paper called Motai Paxos, which is basically Paxos and complexity on top of it. OK, let's talk about Paxos. No, strike that. Let's talk about cakes. Um, Okay. <laughs> How many of you have the same problem choosing between chocolate cake and cheesecake? Raise your hand if you have the same problem. I definitely do. It's very hard. I love them both. Really? Only a few people. Are. Okay, fine. Um, so as a group, but I assume that all of you like those cakes, right? Okay, good. Um, otherwise, this talk won't like work. So um, as a group, after this talk, or after the conference, we're going to go out and buy a huge cake. But the problem is that we can only pick one. It has to be either chocolate cake or a cheesecake. So how do we work this out? How do we have consensus as a big group? So usually how this happens is someone will say, have we proposed, well, have we decided on which flavor to pick yet? And some other person will say, no, not really. We haven't decided yet. And this original proposer will say, well, let's just go for cheesecake. And then the group will say, well, yeah, sure, let's go for cheesecake. And that is Paxos. <laughs> Yay. So in Paxos, there is the idea of having a proposer, which will be a machine that proposes values to the other machines, and also machines that act as acceptors that they re ac reject or accept values from the proposer. Let's walk through how Paxos, basic Paxos works. So at the beginning, the proposer will choose a proposal value. And then this number has to be the largest proposal number that the machine has ever seen. It's going to send this number to all of the acceptors on the network. And it's going to send out this prepare message that includes this number. When the acceptor accepts the message, it will check, is this number the largest proposal number that I've ever seen? If that's true, the machine will send back a promise saying that I promise you that I will only look at other people's value if they have a larger proposal number. So now, as a proposer, if we get a majority of servers respond to us, that means we're the first one that proposed the value, and we can go ahead and actually propose a value. So now we're going to send out this accept message that has a proposal number and the value that the machine is proposing. Now it's going to broadcast this message to all the acceptors, all the other servers. And the, the other servers will check, is this number still the largest number that I've ever seen? Basically, it's checking, are we, um, is this machine who, is this still the same machine that I sent a promise to? If, if, if that's the case, then we're going to accept the value and also keep track of the proposal number. 
as a proposer, if I got a majority of servers respond to me, and if I get any rejection, that means that my proposal number will, is not the largest number now, so I have to repeat from the beginning. But if I didn't get any rejections, that means my value is chosen, so now we have consensus, and now we can have cheesecake. Yay. And what is this proposal number that we're talking about? Basically, it's a combination of server ID and route number. The server ID guarantees the uniqueness of the proposal number, and the route number is, will get incremented over time. And it's shared between all the machines, and also all the machines keep track of the highest route number that it has ever seen. So to generate a new proposal number, simply increment the max route number and concatenate it with the server ID. That was basic Paxos, and now multi-Paxos, you can think of it as an implementation of basic Paxos concepts. You can think of multi-Paxos as a sequence of instances that uses basic Paxos, and it deal with log entries. Uh, so how this works is we have a client that will want to um, ask our machine to execute task for, for it. So it's gonna send some command to our leader as a leader, we're going to use basic Paxos to have consensus to agree on which command to execute for the current log entry. And once it has figured that out with the, uh, the other machines, it's going to wait for all the commands to be applied and executed before executing the current command. And once that's done, we, we apply the results to our client. So what is this leader and non-leader thing in Paxos? A leader is a distinguished proposer, is a server that has the highest ID and is responsible for sending heartbeats to the other machines every once in a while, basically saying, hey, I'm still alive, please treat me as a leader. And its responsibility is to accept client requests uh, so that to process and to use basic packs to have consensus with other machines. As a follower, if I didn't receive a heartbeat from the leader within a certain, after a certain amount of time, I would just automatically assume that the server has crashed or died or whatever. So I'm trying to, will try to act as a leader and also act as a proposer. If everything works right, as a follower, I will redirect client requests to my leader and also act as a uh, acceptor. In Paxos, it's very unlikely to have two leaders at the same time. However, the algorithm is designed to be able to tolerate multiple leaders, but the problem is it won't work as efficient as having only one leader. Some of the industry examples is Google Chubby and Apache Zookeeper. I drew those, so I'm really proud. <laughs> and let's talk about Raft. So Raft uh, was designed by Diego Ongarol and John Osterhot at Stanford. People in the industry recognize Raft as a simpler version of Paxos, but I think when people say it's simpler, it doesn't mean that it's logically simpler. What people think, well, why people think it's simpler is because the um, paper has more details of the algorithms, and therefore it's easier for us to understand it. In terms of performance and fault tolerance is equivalent to Paxos, on top of consistency and correctness, the algorithm also um, design, was designed with the mindset of being, making people, helping people to be able to understand the algorithm itself. So why did the professors really focus on understandabilities of the, of the algorithm? Basically, if you think about it, in the real world, right, in the industry, when we develop our own, when we implement the consensus algorithms, we usually have to twist the algorithm a little to fit into our own environment. And when we do that, if we want to change the algorithms, we really have to understand how and why the algorithms works before doing that. So to be able to help people to adapt and use the algorithm in the industry, they really worked on understandability. Okay. Let's talk, oh, so different from Raft, uh, sorry, different from Paxos, Raft works around logs. And let's talk about cakes again. I'm gonna pick someone. Um, what's her name? Kate. Kate, can I use her name? Yeah. In the, okay, great, and Kate, we as a group, we trust you, um, so you're the best person in the world to pick a cake flavor. Okay. Tell me which, which one would you like to have, chocolate or cheesecake? Chocolate. 
Okay, yes, I was just thinking about the same. Okay, so Kate said chocolate. So we're, on a, we're, we're gonna buy chocolate. And as a leader, we will just act as followers. We'll just listen to whatever you say. And that is Raft. <laughs> Yay, so this is how Raft works. We have two different phases. The first phase is leader election. So we select one machine to be the leader and we detect when leader crashes and redo the election. We also have log replication where now we have a leader. Basically now we have Kate saying we're gonna go for chocolate. So as a follower, we just do whatever she said. Um, so we replicate logs from the leader. So let's take a look at how leader election works. Different machines all get a random different sign timeout time. And once the machine times out, it will become a candidate, it will start the election, and it will increment its own term. This term number is a number that keeps track of what's the current, how many elections basically we run through. And it's going to vote for itself, and then it's going to send this remote uh, procedure call called request vote RPC to other servers, trying to collect votes, get votes from the other servers. And basically three things could happen from there. Um, if everything works well, all the servers, well, most of them will respond. If we get a majority amount of responses, we will become a leader, and then we will start sending heartbeats to the other machines. And at the same time, we'll handle the client request. But in the middle of our gathering vote process, if we got a heartbeat from a leader, that means someone has already became a leader. So now we will step down as a follower. And then we will act as a follower to redirect client request to the leader. And there's a third case that could happen where um, two machines, neither of us got a majority amount of votes. That means they had a split vote scenario. That means they will have to time out and go back to the election state. We'll talk about that case in the later slides. So how do we know really uh, in leader election works? Basically, you can only vote for one machine per term, and the machine, whoever receives the majority amount of vote will win and become the leader. Um, so the majority amount of vote is basically N, which is the overall number of machines in the system, divided by two plus one. So one example in here would be uh, server zero and two and three all votes for server zero, and then server one and four vote for servers one. So because of this, server zero will become a leader. So there eventually will be a leader based on how the algorithm is designed. Um, all the machines will get a random election timeout at the beginning. Usually the default timeout that's recommended in the paper is 100 to 300 milliseconds. So usually what happens is one machine times out first and becomes a leader because it collected the majority amount of vote. But if two machines happen to time out at the exact same time, now we could have a split vote scenario where they both have, they kind of just split the vote and neither of them got a majority amount of vote. When that happens, we will have an election timeout. So this is a, after a certain amount of time, nobody became a leader, so they will just time out and restart the election. Okay, now let's look at log replication. This is the second phase. So now we do have a leader. Our client will want the leader to do something. So it's going to send a command to the leader, and the leader will append this command to his own log entry, and the leader will send append entry remote procedure calls to the other machines saying that I have appended this log, appended this entry in my log. Please do the same and the other machines will do that and send acknowledgements back to the leader, we'll tell, telling the leader that I've done what, whatever you told me to. Um, then if we get a majority amount of responses, that means it's safe for us to commit this current entry. And by commit, we mean that it's safe to execute it and it's also safe to return the result to the client. So we'll just apply and commit this entry and return the result back to the client and then we're going to send a re the same append entry RPC again to our followers saying that we want you to also do the same because I've returned my result to the client. So that was if everything works out well, right? So what happens if we didn't get a majority of responses from the servers? 
once when you're trying to ask your servers to append entries to, your, to their log, if you only get, let's say in this case, only got one response, and it's definitely not majority, what's going to happen is that the leader will just retry and sending, kept sending um, append entry RPCs until it gets the majority amount of responses. How, what does the log entry, it looks like this. So you have a term number which keeps track of the current term, basically when was the term that the current leader was elected. Also it keeps track of the command that is going to execute for the current entry. And also you know the index of the entry. How do we ensure the consistency of server? Server could crash, right? So the goal is that we don't, we don't want to lose information. How do I ensure that? And this is one example of inconsistent log. As you can see, server 0 and 2, they have a longer log than server 1. And server 1, you know, this happened could because server 1 crashed during some of the, um, some of the machine time or it was partitioned out of the network. So it has a shorter and, um, log. So how do we guarantee log consistency in Raft? Basically, you always trust the leader's log. You do not elect a leader that does not have a complete log. And we do not allow any holes in the log. That means you always append entries to the end of your log. You do not skip um, entries. And we also repair inconsistencies when we replicate logs from the leader. Sorry. How do we um, guarantee the completeness of uh, leader's log? Basically, when you send the request vote RPC, it should have the following information. It has the term, which is, again, the candidate's when was the, when was the, um, the leader was elected, and the candidate's ID. Um, also, what is the last log index of the current candidate? What is the last log term of the current candidate? So it has the four information in the um, remote procedure calls that it's going to send to the other machine. And one example here would be, you can see the blue one is the candidate that's trying to become a leader, and the green one as ourselves, the current state machine. So let's take a look at this example together. If we receive this RPC message, um, we know that the candidate's term is two, our term is three, and we have different IDs, which is expected. And our, compared to the candidate, we have the same log index and same log term. In this case, do we want to reject or vote for the leader, for the candidate? Raise your hand if we think we should vote. Raise your hand if we think we shouldn't vote. Okay, what about those who didn't raise their hands? Okay, so the, the answer is we reject the vote because compared to the term, the uh, candidate has a, a smaller term. That means we went through more election times. And that means we probably have a better, more accurate, and more complete log compared to the candidate. So we do not vote for the candidate in this case. Let's do some quizzes. Everyone loves quizzes. Hey, what about this case? Let's walk through this together. If we have the candidate's term as three, our term is also three. Uh, we have different IDs which are expected. And the last log index of the candidate is three, but our last log index is four, and we have the same last log term. So raise your hand if you think we should vote for the candidate. Raise your hand if you think we shouldn't vote for the candidate. Oh, yeah, okay, cool. We shouldn't vote for the candidate because the candidate has a uh, smaller last log index. That means our log is longer, so we do not vote for the candidate. We want a leader that has a complete log. What about this one? So we have the same term and different IDs. Last log index candidate is longer, is larger, and term is the same. Raise your hand if you think we should vote. OK. I, I think I shouldn't ask the, uh, the other question. We'll probably get it. So we definitely accept vote because uh, this case, our candidate has a longer log. So that means it's safe to vote for the candidate. How do I really repair inconsistencies once we have a leader? So remember the append entry remote procedure calls that we sent to all these servers. That includes the following information. It has all of the information of the current entry, which is the index, the term, and the command. 
but it also has a little information about the previous entry. So it has the index and the term. It's going to send those, those five things to the other server. So as a leader, I want my followers to append the entries. I want my followers to trust my log, right? So I'm going to send those following informations to my candidate, uh, sorry, to my followers. And what my followers will do is that they will check the previous entry. So they will check at index four, do I have the same term number as the leader? So in this given example, uh, our server one is the follower. So it will check, okay, at index four, do I have term two? If I do, that means it's safe to replicate the leader's log. I can just append whatever the leader gave me to my own log entry. So in this case, we're just going to put the entry five to our own log. However, in this case, if we have at index four have a different term from the leader's log, that means we probably don't have the same log entry. So that's inconsistency. And as a follower, what we do is we reject the leader. We say our log do not match, I'm sorry. But our leader won't give up because it knows that it's correct, right? The leader is always right. So it's going to just go one more previous entry. So instead of four, it's going to three. So it's going to send three's index and term and four and five, all of those information to the follower. And now the follower will check at, at index three, do I have term one? Yes, we do. So now we can assume that all the entries prior to index three has the same log entries, plus we have the exact same entries at, term, at um, index three. So now we're just going to append entry four and five to our own log. So now we have consistent logs compared to the leader. And because of that, we can uh, have this log matching property in Raft. Basically, you can just compare index and the term of an entry. If they match, that means you can assume two things. One, the two entries store the exact same command. Two, all the previous entries prior to this current entry are all exactly the same. So for example, server zero and one at index five, they both have term two. That means everything is the same up to uh, entry five. But for server zero and two, they have different terms at the same index. So that means we cannot assume the following properties. Are there any problems with consensus algorithms? There are problems with everything. So, and I really like that panda that I drew. Uh, so, when we're, dealing with cons uh, when we're dealing with distributed systems, we have to communicate via sending messages to each other. And because of that, we have a huge amount of overhead between the machines because we have to constantly send messages and usually it takes several rounds before we actually have consensus. So how do we deal with the overhead with messages? And how do we recognize duplicate messages? How do we know if messages are out of order? How do we take care of the lost messages? How do we even know if the messages are lost? Um, how do we deal with network latencies? Those are all the things that we have to consider when implementing consensus algorithms. What about machine failures? We could easily have leader failures and follower failures. What if there are network partitions? What about confidentiality? Who has the right to read and who has the right to write to the machines? And I apologize for this picture. I tried many times to draw it right, but it's just, I can't do it in a less creepier way. So that's, yeah. But yeah, dinosaur is much better. Um, so how do we deal with malicious peers? How do we know if a peer is malicious? And how do we prevent them from abusing the information from the system? One example of um, malicious peers is this Byzantine generals problem. So what this is, is Let's just say you have two generals and they're trying to decide one thing. They're trying to decide whether to attack a castle or retreat from it. And they can only communicate by sending messages to each other. They cannot directly communicate in person. They have a messenger. Um, so if they both decide on one thing, so if they both decide to retreat or to attack, they will win the war. But if they decide, if they make a different decision from the other one, they will lose. This problem sounds really simple to solve, but the problem is you do not know whether the, the other server is a traitor or not. So that just made things a lot more complicated. How this applies in distributed system settings is you can have a machine that acts normally, 
and it is able to receive messages, it's able to respond to messages, everything works fine. You cannot really tell whether, you know, what's wrong with the server, but instead it's a compromised server. It could send malicious remote procedure calls to the other machines, and it could corrupt other data, and it could abuse the information from the system. So are there any algorithms that could have Byzantine fault tolerant? Yes, there are. They're modified Byzantine Paxos and Raft. But the problem with those protocols is that they have even a larger amount of overhead. Um, and some of the takeaways, so in the industry, when you find yourself having to implement consensus algorithms, well, the first thing is try not to do that because when you are uh, understanding our consensus algorithm is very different from implementing algorithms. You have to think about a lot about the edge cases and all the things that you need to handle. And proving that your algorithm is right is even harder. So when in the industry, when you need consensus algorithms, if you could find an algorithm that has been proven that it works correctly, it's probably the best to use that algorithm. But you do, if you do have to implement the consensus algorithms, you need to think about, is my system resilient against the issues that we've mentioned before? And the most more important is that do you want your server to be resilient, right? You don't always have to be resilient to, 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 be, uh, to be resilient against everything. It's always a trade-off between re reliability and complexity. So you need to think about what decision, what do I want it to be resilient against as a developer. When you're designing consensus algorithms in the academia, on top of consistency and correctness, you also need to uh, think about understandability. You would want your users to be able to understand your algorithms before using them and twist them uh, in their own network. So that concludes my talk. I'm Yifan, and thank you for your attention. But oh, wait, hold on. Before I do the clapping thing, I just wanna, I just wanna ask, how many of you love chocolate cake? Raise your hand. Yay! Yay. How many of you love cheesecake? Oh, okay, so it's like 50-50. I don't know how to solve this problem. All right, now I can do the clapping. Thank you. I, I, I can take questions.